Okay, I thought I'd talk a little bit about making an eye beam in polymumps. But first we want to understand why would we want to make an eye beam and what are the advantages of it. So if we go back to the cantilever as a basic structure, and we do that often in um, polymumps, if we attach it on both ends it becomes a um, um, a beam or a bridge, and if we attach it on one end we call it a cantilever. But the one thing to understand about cantilevers is that there is a spring constant associated with it. Okay, so the spring constant, K, is a function of material property called bulk modulus times the thickness cubed times the width of the cantilever divided by 4L cubed, all underneath the square root sign. Okay? That being the case, um, we, can, we can analyze this equation and determine what the spring constant is. The spring constant is associated with how stiff a spring is, how stiff the cantilever is in this case. So you can see the T cubed in the numerator means that the thicker you make the cantilever, the thicker this gets, the stiffer it is and the harder it is going to be to bend. The longer you make it, the less stiff it is, and the easier it is to bend. So you can imagine if I make this cantilever very, very short, right, to, to maybe this distance, I, it's going to be hard to bend. But the longer I make it, the easier it is to bend. Likewise, if I make the um, thickness very, very thick, since that's in the numerator, it's very, very hard to bend. It gets a lot stiffer. So, so if you take a cantilever, you can pull it down and let go and it'll vibrate up and down along this very thin side. But if you try to get it to vibrate left and right for this um, picture on this first cantilever, left and right it won't um, want to bend and it won't oscillate very much. So if we rotate the cantilever um, uh, 90 degrees, then you can see it won't oscillate up and down anymore because that's the thick, thicker part and the thickness is on the top of the um, uh, fraction within the square root sign. Okay, So, if we wanted to make something that bends up and down real easy, we would use this um, type of cantilever. If we wanted it to bend easily left and right, we would make this structure here on the right side. Now you can imagine if you take a um, if you're building a roof, for example, you would probably want your 2 by 6s this structure here. So you'd want your 2 by 6s this is um, 6 inches, for example, if you're making a roof. Okay, and the width here would be 2 inches. You'd want to orientate them ver vertically because when you add the roof to it, okay, that load is going to be up and down, so it'll be along the thick side. So this won't bend much. If I were to take my 2x6s and orient them like they are on the left and try to put a, a load um, on top of it, for example a roof, and I push down on it, this thing will sag and it will start to bend very easily. Okay? So a lot of times you'll see roof structures where they take the 2x6s or 2x4s and they'll ro rotate them so that the um, vertical part is the longest dimension. And that's just so it doesn't bend so easily. All right. Sure. So we can make a structure that's very, very stiff. And this is kind of the conceptual idea behind that. If you take three cantilevers, in this case, oriented in three directions, two of which are the same, and combine them, okay, you equal an I-beam. Now let's look at this I-beam structure a little more closely. So it, this structure by itself on top, okay, this middle one is going to want to flex this way very easily. But up and down, it's not going to flex much. So I've indicated that with the short and the long blue arrows. Okay, likewise, the right and left structure, it's going to want to, um, it, can, it can bend very easily up and down, right, in the vertical dimension. And, um, but left and right, it's not going to do that. Okay, so very little bending ability, right? It's much, much stiffer going left and right. 
And you have the same thing on, on this side. Okay, and this is much, much easier to bend. So if you combine all three of these into an I-beam, you're going to have very little bending capable, very little bending capable in this direction, and a lot more um, bending in this direction for this part of the beam. But look at this. We have these cross sections here, which allow, don't allow you to bend much in the left and right direction. doesn't let you a lot, um, bend in the left and right direction, okay? So you can see it's not going to want to bend left and right because of these top and bottom parts of the I-beam, and it's not going to want to bend up and down because of the, the stiff part of the vertical um, part of the I-beam. And why make it an I-beam? Well, we could make it just a, a square cross-section, right? We made it a big square. Okay, we'd have the same effects, and you see that in houses, right? They have beams, 4x4 four four beams, 6x6 six six beams, and the reason they're square and not 2x6s um, is because it makes it stiff in both the vertical and the uh, left-right directions. We make I-beams out of metal and things like that because we won't use as much material. All this material is gone, and you still get the same um, benefit and same strength and stiffness. Also, it's a lot lighter if you get rid of that excess material. Okay, so I-beams are really good and they won't bend up and down and they won't bend left and right. This is really advantageous when you're making thermal actuators if you do not want them to bend out of plane. So if we build a polymomps I-beam, right, we would do a poly one cantilever or bridge structure like you see on the bottom here. So this is poly one. Okay, and then we would draw a poly 2 beam on top of it, which is what you see here. And then in between you do a um, poly 2, poly 1 via. So that would be a slot to connect the poly 2 to the poly 1. Now this would be a very, very stiff structure. And if you remember from the thermal actuator um, short lecture, right, the, the resistivity is a function of the cross-sectional area okay, and the length of the device. So the, the smaller the cross-sectional area, the higher the resistivity. Okay, if you, if you remember, it was resistance equals resistivity, L over A. I think I used um, beta as the resistivity in the other lecture. So we've got a um, material property called resistivity times L the length over the cross-sectional area, which is this part here. Okay, so this is the cross-sectional area right here. All right, so if we make two thin cantilevers and connect them like with an I-beam, we get the benefit of having high resistance, um, small cross-sectional area, and we get two of them on top of each other, plus we get the benefit of the stiffness. Okay, so now we've got two polymomps I-beams, or two polymomps beams, connected with a um, poly 2, poly 1 via here, resulting in a polymomps I-beam. Now, why would we want to do that? Well, from the previous discussion, okay, we know that, um, we know that the, the left-right motion is restricted, so it's not going to want to bend this way because we have this long or this thick part on the bottom. So it won't want to bend much in, in the left-right direction. Likewise, it won't want to bend in the vertical direction either because you've got this I-beam structure that makes it very, very stiff. Now, if you didn't have the poly-1 or the poly-2 and you just had one of them alone, then it would, could flex much, much easier um, about this axis, okay? So if we make an I-beam, it's going to be stiff in, from left to right and stiff up and down. Okay, why is that important for thermal action? Well, if you look at a beam and you restrict it between two walls, like we're showing here, this is a wall, this is a wall. Now we're going to heat up this beam, and it's going to want to expand, and it's got to go somewhere. It's going to want to get longer, but these walls make it so it can't get longer in the left to right direction. So there's going to be a resultant force that wants to pop it up, and it could also pop it down. So you could get a structure that looks like this, or a structure that looks like this. Okay? So that's kind of funky. 
Um, right? So if I add heat to this, it's going to want to bend up or down. Okay, let's say we don't have a wall, we just want to push something. The left side is, is um, say, fixed in place, but the right side is going to be able to, to extend. Then the amount you can push is dependent on the temperature change, of course, right? Delta T, um, which, which uh, results in a delta L uh, length change. So it's going to want to get longer. And if you, if you can move this wall, it's going to want to move it to the, to the right in that case, okay? But if it's pushing too hard on it, and say it gets stuck, then it may just pop out of plane, right? And you'll get the beam to do this kind of thing out of plane, and it won't push on anything. Or it can, can go down and get, go out of plane going in, in the downward direction, and it could end up scraping on the substrate or the, the silicon nitride that's on top of the substrate in the case of polymumps. So you, you have this problem of, of things popping out of plane and not staying in the plane. Remember, there is a Z component to the forces, and if you make it big enough, it'll cause the structure to bend and deform in the Z direction. Okay? So um, when you're designing your, your thermal actuators, your V-thermal actuators, or your hot-cold, you can consider doing an I-beam design and combining both poly-2 and poly-1 using a poly-2, poly-1 B in between. All right, so let me know if you have any questions. I hope this helps your understanding.